I am Marcus James Dixon with Gold Derby, and we would like to welcome Nathan Johnson to our Film Composers Oscar shortlist panel uh, for his work on Netflix's Glass Onion, a Knives, a Knives Out Mystery. And Nathan, congrats on the shortlist um, mention at the Oscars. Uh, tell me, what was that like when you found out that that news? That doesn't happen every day. It doesn't. It uh, no, it was it was great. I mean, it's you know we've been working on this movie for the last couple of years, and uh, it's it's kind of a, a giddy feeling to finally get it out in the wild and to 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 let people start responding to it. Um, mm -hmm. And in a way, just just seeing seeing people's response to the movie kind of feels like uh, when Ryan first sent me the script, and I just read it by myself. Here, I was so so excited about it. So it's really fun to see other people responding in that way as well. Did you ever think, you know, three or four years ago, when you were scoring the first Knives Out, that you would be doing the second, and then may maybe future Knives Outs as well? I mean, we did. We were not thinking about these as anything more than Knives Out. So it's mm -hmm. it's been really fun. But also, I think it's a testament to Ryan when you know when he did send me the script. I was so excited because not only is it a whole new cast, but it's a whole new it's a whole new structure. Even the way the movie's structured tonally, it it feels so so vastly different from the first one. And and for me, that means we get to. Um, we get to kind of play in the same sonic world that we set up, but essentially we get to do a brand new score for this. Mm -hmm. And how did you go about creating the new score, but you have to make sure it sounded similar to the first one because of the, you know, it's it's a franchise basically. And you don't want to repeat yourself though. So it must have been interesting conversations you guys had. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the way we keep it in the sound world is is sort of sonically, and it's something that that we were really excited about with the first one. We were talking about, you know, let's do a full orchestra, but let's let's have precision be the defining thing for this. Um, you know, so it's not it's not like an atmospheric washy wall of sound. Every every section we can hear the players, but also we can hear the imperfection. We can hear the the scratch of the bows on the string. We can hear the the breathing of the of the wind and the brass players. Um, and and so that world to me, I mean, I I love I love love imperfection in music. Um, and and that's been something just since I was a, a kid that I enjoyed. So it feels really rewarding to be working with some of the best players in the world, but to kind of take approaches and use techniques where it feels very very human. Um, so that, you know, that, I think that sound world is, is in the same place, but, um, but for Knives Out, it's, you know, the first thing Ryan and I talked about was this is, we want to kind of put a flag in the ground that this is going to be welcoming everybody on this lush sort of old, almost old Hollywood grand classic journey. Um, you know, we were talking about scores that we loved growing up, Nino Rhoda's uh, score for Death on the Nile and, um, you know, kind of, kind of these these classic Italian composers who who really put melody and, and thematic writing at the forefront. Uh, and to me, that that just kind of is the most exciting sandbox to get to play in with these worlds. And before the movie came out, you did an interview with one of my colleagues, Chris Rosen, and you talked about how a character might be stealing another character's music cues. And I know you couldn't say anything because the movie hadn't been released, but now that it's been out, and I, I assume everyone has watched on Netflix or, or in the theater, um, can you talk a little bit more about that aspect? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the um, these movies are very fun. Obviously, also, there's the mystery and the ominous sense, but, but the thing that I've realized is... Um, you know, it, everything sort of hinges on the audience's connection with the protagonist, and the protagonist is not Blanc. It's not the detective character. Um, in this movie, the protagonist is Andy, and uh, Janelle Monae's character, and she starts as very much an outsider, but but by the halfway through point, she's very much our protagonist, and and so Andy's theme is, um, you know, it, it has to be this theme that that can keep morphing throughout the movie as we keep mm. learning more things about her. It needs to be, it needs to be very powerful yet vulnerable at the same time. It needs to, it needs to be ominous yet romantic. Um, 
And there's a moment in the movie where, where Miles, Edward Norton's character, is up in the glass onion talking with, uh, with Block. And he's spinning this tale about, you know, he's looking at a picture and talking about how he misses that bar and uh, how Andy was the only one who would tell him the truth. And, and I suggested to Ryan, I was like, what if, what if Blanc's or sorry, what if Miles' character steals Andy's theme here, <laughs> sort of in the way that he stole her company. Um, and also because he's, he's kind of spinning this tale to Blanc. And, and for me, as I was thinking about his character, it seemed appropriate that, um, you know, Edward Norton talked about Miles as being the kind of character who never had an original thought in his life. And it just seemed really appropriate to me that as he's talking about this very vulnerable moment, that he would need to tap into Andy's character to sell that, um, to sell that story to Block. I love that so much. I can't wait to go back and watch those scenes. <laughs> I want to see how it, it plays out. Um, and Janelle Monet, just as a side, that's this is the best I've ever seen her. Oscar voters, She's please don't phenomenal. forget her. Yeah, she is really, really phenomenal on this. And the great Daniel Craig is also phenomenal. He's back as Detective Benoit Block. Uh, he solves the most unsolvable crimes. He has, he's such a fun original character. How do you go about coming up with his a uh, theme. His his. What instruments do you use to bring that across? Yeah. So Blanc has a few motifs that that you know we hear in the first Knives Out and that come forward just for moments in this one. I, I think one of the things about Blanc that I love is um, that he he is constantly kind of reinventing himself based on what he needs other people to believe about him. You know, his his whole goal is to peel back the layers to kind of pull at this thread and find out what's going on. Um, and when, I, when I'm writing for Blanc, I'm, I'm kind of imagining just this little wry smile. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely mystery and he's, he, he has a purpose, but, um, but I think it's one of the things that we love about, about this character that Daniel has brought to life is um, he's, he's a very smart person, but he really has a heart and he also has a bit a bit of a smile as he approaches anything, everything. So that's that's really what I'm thinking about Blanc, as well as um, keeping in mind that thing that I said earlier that he is not our protagonist. So so Blanc's motifs um, appear for moments, but but really it's about how they how they play and push against all the themes that I'm writing for all of the new characters in each in each film. Mm. There's the scene at the beginning where some of the characters are talking about how the Bach fugue is essentially this musical puzzle. And I imagine as the composer, you maybe had fun with that fugue concept. Yeah, I mean, the, the danger is to go down a very heady, nerdy thing and, and say like, I'm gonna compose the whole thing as a fugue. Um, and, I, and I kind of did play around with the fugue format at the beginning, but very, very quickly, um, as Ryan and I were talking, it, it it becomes like let's not just do let's just not just do a nerdy thing for the sake of itself, but but getting back to that thing that's always the main job of every composer is don't bring a clever thing into this. Make sure we're connecting with the emotion that we need to be feeling at each part of the story. Um, and you know, I, I maybe a maybe a smarter composer could have done that, but I think for me, it's it's very much the the job of us as, as a as a writer for for visual music is to connect with each emotional moment and to, to kind of um, make sure we're, we're helping the audience feel what they need to be feeling, especially in a movie like Glass Onion where it's, there's so much, everything is precisely constructed, um, you know, and it, it very much is an engineered movie in terms of the audience tracking what we need to be tracking and the score helping us do that. I love the main Glass Onion theme, the whimsical, fun, kind of light feeling. I believe that was a harpsichord that yep. was playing that. Um, do you recall the moment where you realized, you know, this is it, this is the theme, let's lock this in? Definitely, yeah, and it's, I, I recall it because it took me a while to get there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Ryan and I are cousins and we've been making movies together our, our whole lives. So I, I bring a writing rig with me onto set and I'm, I'm kind of watching the tone develop and working on working on theme explorations in the evening. Um, 
And I wanted to try to crack the main theme first. And it, it took a couple of tries, but I remember when I finally played it for Ryan and it's, it's that thing that as a composer, you hope to see in your director's eyes, they, they kind of light up and, and you realize, you know, I, I don't consider my job um, necessarily to, to just be bringing what, what I want to bring to the table. I really consider my job to be, how do I get inside the director's brain and somehow partner with them to tell the story that ultimately that they're wanting to tell. Um, but I, yeah, I remember that moment and, and his light, his eyes lighting up and, and in a way that kind of unlocked tonally the entire movie. Um, once I, once I understood that, then I understood, okay, I, now I know what the whole movie is going to feel like. Hmm. Well, thank you for chatting with us, Nathan, and and best of luck going forward at, at all, all these award shows coming up. Can't wait Thanks. to see what happens. Thank you.